Hi, and welcome to RBP on JSB. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and today we're going to be discussing the second movement of Bach's Partita No. 3 in E major, the Lorraine. By the way, if you want to hear a discussion about some of the general issues that pertain to all of the Bach sonatas and partitas, please be sure to watch the overview episode. So a Lorraine is only a French dance. There's no such thing as a German Lorraine or an Italian one. Other dances, of course, exist in multiple places. You've got your French jig or your Italian giga or your English jig, etc. But this is clearly just a French dance, and the fact that Bach put it in this suite is kind of telling you this is a French suite. Now, lures are so uncommon that you very well might not have played one before. So let's talk about how to do it. It's a slow and stately dance, yes, but it's not a lyrical slow movement. In other words, it really shouldn't be done legato as if it's just some kind of a beautiful largo or something. And I'm having a hard time playing it that way. I don't think I've done it that way since I was 11. Anyway, um, so yeah, there is space. It does breathe. It is supposed to evoke the dance. In other words, it wouldn't have been played for real live dancers, but yet you should imagine the fact that there are people dancing to it and your playing should inspire people to do their moves. So slow and stately, yes, but with some space. your first um, end of a section. So, da -dum, bam. that's always going to have a little bit of lift and not be gooey. So, you can just practice without even any notes. And making sure that the um, eighth note is de-emphasized, not but da -dum, ba, da -dum, ba. And in French music particularly, uh, I'm talking about in the, in the 18th century, different story in the 17th century, but we don't need to get into that. In the 18th century, generally, German and Italian music was played with straight eighths or sixteenths or whatever the, the note value was of the movement, even rhythm. And French music was played with uneven rhythm that they called inégal, in other words, unequal little bit of a swing, but a very elegant swing, not your kind of down and dirty, you know, folk music swing. Um, so the, the slight unequal notes that they consider to be the height of fashion. And in fact, there is even a composition by Couperin where he attempts to have an apotheosis of the opposing Italian and French styles and bring them happily together. Um, very funny sort of musical debate going on. So Bach was a German composer. This is French music filtered through the eyes of a German. This is not exactly as a piece by Couperin or Marais or Rameau or Lully or any of those guys would have looked like. And yet Bach still, you know, got the point. And in order to give it a little bit of that French flavor, let's call it fusion music or something, right? Um, using fusion in, in terms of how they talk about fusion cuisine. So German slash French or French-ish German or something like that. We do want to have a little bit of swing so that our eighths are not quite even. And that means that, no, it's not overdotting, not even close to overdotting. It's just this little imperceptible bit of swing. as opposed to one and two and three, then you're gonna sound German. But if you wanna sound a little French, so then this eighth comes in not quite exactly midpoint in the beat, right? that 
But this 16th here in measure 4 is actually the same animal as the first eighth note in measure 1. Because the only reason Bach writes it as a 16th is because it's following a quarter tied to a dotted eighth as opposed to following a dotted quarter. But, you know, Bach didn't really go in for, you know, cluttering things up with a bunch of double dots. He could have written the opening measure as double dotted quarter followed by a sixteenth, and that would have been equally as inaccurate. It's neither an eighth nor a sixteenth. The one in four isn't exactly a sixteenth. It's this same swing. So... Those are both the same rhythmic value um, of this slightly swung note. It's hard to put into words and you definitely can't notate it mathematically on the page. Actually, the one and only time I gave a master class, uh, well, thus far, as of this date, um, the one and only time that I gave a master class where the student picked up on it instantly was down in, I forget which, South American country. And maybe um, the music from that country might have had a bit of swing, so he got the point. It's hard for people who are used to playing mostly music that doesn't swing to suddenly start swinging, but just Try to give yourself a little bit of an exercise, maybe. going to go da 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 kind of group the four notes da, 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 da. so some kind of slight tenuto on the first one da, da, da. Um, now if it were real french music you would probably do a tiresculé here but that's a whole different animal and um, i'm not sure if bach really wanted you to go that far so don't even worry about it unless you've played a lot of french music already in your life and know what i'm talking about if you don't know what I'm talking about, then that means don't worry about it. So, measure four, just making sure that it sounds not quite even, but not making each of the two notes into its own animal, but just... And the same thing when you have a four-note slur in measure 13. So, sometimes I do a tier schoolay when I do a repeat, but... Um, that kind of thing. Um, there are a couple times, well, look at measure 13, or 12 for that matter. Now we have the Lure theme um, in canon. So the first voice, um, and the second voice, so, so again, unequal ace because and the lower voice. And here also, in measure 13, unequal ace. So just getting used to that type of thing. If you have a chance to listen to some French music played by um, period instrument, you know, historically informed interpretation, French Baroque players, it's rather difficult to know what it is you're imitating if you aren't familiar with the thing that's being imitated. So if you've never played French Baroque music, which you might not have, at least listen to some. Um, getting the sheet music and trying to play some isn't going to do it be, unless you're being coached by somebody who knows what the style is. It's like, you know, getting a piece of Scottish fiddling. If you don't know how a Strathspey is supposed to go, then seeing it on the page doesn't tell you anything. So um, same thing with French Baroque. It's, you know, somehow or another on our modern instruments, we can totally play German Baroque music, Italian Baroque music, but we, you know, French Baroque music is such a foreign language that tends to be left to the period instrument crowd. But now here we are with this very commonly played and popular Bach sonata, um, or partita, from his cycle, and it's imitating French Baroque, and what do we do with that? So, yeah, so this little bit of swing, and you, you can get the hang of it. All right, so another thing about rhythm is hemiolas, and there are four possible places where those might be, um, some of them much more obvious than others in this movement, and who knows, maybe there are even some others that you'll find that I haven't yet. But a, a hemiola is where a big three is superimposed on top of two small threes. So instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, it's one and two and 
three, and where the three, the beat, becomes the half note momentarily. And a couple of these actually go across the bar line. Um, and cadences are a very common place for them to occur. So the first one is halfway through measure 10. Here, one, two, three, one. So instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, we're going to, and then taking it up so we can have a down bow. And having those big threes come in from time to time just kind of mixes things up in movements in three and um, is a really fun way to create rhythmic variety. There's another one in measure 14. One, two, three, four. So then we have actually another beat of small, uh, or set of small three before our ultimate cadential note. Now this one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, could be two small threes. And after all, the bass line does seem to carry that pattern. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So you could argue that in actual ensemble music, it did sometimes happen that one voice would have a hemiola and another voice might not. And so they would have these elided rhythms. And so I think that's what's happening here because if you listen to the treble voice, that feels so much better than so. so again, just for the sake of variety, since I am only one person playing both of those voices, I can't emphasize both things simultaneously in a way. So I'm erring in favor of the upper voice doing the hemiola, even though the lower voice isn't quite, because it just makes it a little more interesting. <laughs> So the real note to decide about is that one, because if it's the and of the big two in the hemiola voice, but it's the one of the second um, measure in three, or pattern in three of the lower voice, then you either have to play it strong or you have to play it light. You can't do both simultaneously because it's only one bow and one person. So I play it lightly. <laughs> So make your own decision, but it's something to experiment with. Other one, uh, measure middle of measure 19. Um, and clearly the lower voice is doing it also. And then measure 23. And here you'll notice I didn't, I didn't hold the lower voice because your cellist would. Actually, it's French music. It would be your viola da gamba player. And another thing about the French music and phrasing, of course, things like measure two. It's very, very typical in French ornamentation for a trill to occur at the little end of a phrase, different than how we think about Italian music where the trill gives it the emphasis. So here, it's very Frenchy to go. And so thinking, well, that trill means that it's not the end of a phrase, or something, or, but, That would actually have been very typical and works very nicely for this music because then you get your last note of measure two being your pickup still, which of course fits with the rhythmic pattern that's been established. Hope that makes a little bit of sense. Speaking of harmonies um, and trills and notes and everything, measure 22, last beat. A lot of people play this as a D natural because you're going to a D natural. Some people don't even think about it. That's just what they automatically do. 
but in fact, the key signature has a D sharp in it, and Bach hasn't yet written a D natural, so... Having the um, D sharp in the trill, as if you're going to resolve, but then changing the key on you, and putting the seven there into the chord, it actually makes the following D natural more special to have the innocent um, E major trill in the previous beat. So I would urge you to just do a D sharp with your trill on the last beat of 22. At first, it almost sounds wrong because you've probably never heard anybody not play that trill with a D natural, so it feels like a wrong note. But once you sort of clear your ear of that and hear it, then it actually makes a whole lot of sense, and it's probably what Bach meant. There's also some interesting stuff that goes between major and minor. So in measure five, it starts to be minor key. The first four measures, nice friendly major key. <laughs> Then C sharp minor. And then not for long. Um, of course, we've also got um, the second half, which kind of starts out getting into minor pretty much right away. minor cadence and then lightens back up then that seems like G sharp major but it's actually kind of the um, five chord of an E minor which we haven't actually heard yet and then it gets even worse G sharp minor, and then finally, and by the way, 21, two little phrases, right? So a, a three note chord doesn't mean it has to be a big fat whoosh, it's not like that one, and actually I should hold my bow down here when I'm playing that. That's totally different kind of dances. Here we have. Taking your time, but always making it dancing and elegant. Um, and while being slow and stately. Um, yeah, so lots of minor key stuff and really make sure that you have a different type of character for the darker keys as opposed to the lighter, more airy keys. And then how long to hold the notes? So a lot of this is obviously implied. Um, for example, you're not gonna hold the, f the very first note um, that has to get clipped would be in measure one. You're not gonna go and kind of slur that in, right? That's gonna be a short quarter, so you can get to your A. You could sustain that, or... Again, you're not gonna make those into true halves. You're just gonna make them feel long, but ultimately have to compromise and let the other voice have its say. But then there are a couple of places where Bach does interesting things. Look at the end of measure six. A quarter note on the lower voice, not carried over into the A sharp. And then measure seven, half notes. So are the, is that just inconsistent? No, I think he wanted those to start to be longer because that makes the line grow. Think about if your viola da gamba player were playing. So they start a little lighter. And that's another phrase. So 
we're really looking at note lengths to actually guide the shape of your interpretation. Also interesting, measure 17, he has a quarter note for the first half of the bar, the first note, and then a half note on that B sharp. And I think that's deliberate because it's very different colors of chords. <laughs> And then here the diminished chord, carrying over into the next note. And then another half note. And this one, which is very odd, which is a dotted quarter. He either does quarters or he does halves, except for this one time. Well, after, okay, I take it back there two times. There's another one in 22. Well, we could talk for hours about what they might mean and why he did it that way, but just pay attention, see which is which and what you can make of it and experiment and think about which notes you want to hold or not hold, but don't ever do anything accidentally and definitely play the voices separately so that you can see how it feels to play just the viol part and then just the violin part and see you know, what decisions you might make based on how those voices would be played if it was indeed an ensemble piece. There's one last thing I want to talk about, which is um, preemptive covered fifths. I am a big fan of pre preemptive covered fifths. If you can set your note, your finger um, in advance in such a way that it doesn't have to later on hop, then you're doing yourself a lot of favors in terms of cleanliness, in terms of you know, the less action, the better, always. Uh, and f there's always a couple hidden in any given piece, and finding them is like a where's Waldo. Sometimes they can really elude you for a while, and I like to be a, hit, a covered fifth detective. But this movement is not at all like where's Waldo. They are all over the place. It's, there, it's littered with them. In fact, let me count how many I've found. I think I found them all at this point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That is a ton. Um, now, of course, it depends on what fingering you're using, but um, let's just walk through some of them. Um, measure two has two of them. So if you set your two here on the second note, then your four is going to go above it, of course. Then you're ready to just pl pl place your three down on the next note, and you don't have to pop your two in between those two notes. It's so, so much nicer, so much easier. It also helps you decide, like what if you wanted to make those two notes a little more legato-y, as opposed to then setting your covered fifth makes that, you know, super easy. Then the next note, set your one on both strings. Right? So that's an obvious one. Measure three. Set your three on both notes. Now, setting on both notes doesn't mean it has to have equal balance as if you were really going to be playing a fifth. That note is high up the fingerboard enough that you can't totally depress both uh, strings. So do like a rocking thing. So you're the tip of your finger is touching both strings. You're not square on the D sharp and nowhere near the G sharp but put the weight of your finger leaning down towards the D-sharp and then just rock it over for the next note. So I'm doing a little bit of a motion here, but what I'm not doing is a big fat hop where I have to lift it off and then set it back on because that's where you start to get messy. Another one, pick up to measure five. You can set your two and rock it. And then this note, set your two. And it's ready for the following in. Set your two. End of measure six. And then there's a couple of them in measure eight. The very first note, so. And then you can't set it here because there's a first finger in the last note of measure seven. But then when you move your two at the first note of measure eight, keep it on both strings. So then you have, you have to hop your three, of course, but at least you don't have to hop both fingers. And then when you set your one down, put it on the covered fifth so you're ready for this note. Now the four is usually too skinny. 
and that guy's going to have to hop. Um, so, yeah, it can get really complicated. Last one of measure 11. Set your two. So you're ready for that. And that's all the ones in the first half. I'll let you be your own. Actually, I'll, tell, I'll give away one in the second half. And then there's only four more left to find, and I'll let you find them. Um, okay, so in measure 13, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that the covered fifth is actually separated by a number of notes. It's not consecutive, but it still helps to do it. So on the downbeat, put your one on both strings. So put it here, and then so that when you get to here on beat three, it's already there. And then, of course, shifting to half position or whatever your fingering is. But if you can go through those first three, first three beats with your one just in that fifth position, covered fifth position, it's so much cleaner and nicer. And like I said, there are four more, and I'll let you find them. So those are some of my thoughts about the Lure in E major. I'm Rachel Barton-Pine, and thank you for watching RBP on JSB.